come to our service of morning prayer on this Friday the 10th of May. We find ourselves in the period of time between Ascension Day and Pentecost and so you will notice uh, a little shift in the liturgy but uh, nothing uh, that will not uh, that won't come up on the screen for you to join in with. Let's just spend a moment in quiet as we come before God in prayer. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, and clothe us with power from on high. Alleluia. Blessed are you, Creator God, to ye be praise and glory for ever. As your Spirit moved over the face of the waters, bringing light and life to your creation, pour out your Spirit on us today, that we may walk as children of light, and by your grace reveal your presence. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God for ever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. This morning comes from Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 11. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier. And the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favourably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then on our reading from Luke by Tom Wright. So where was the faith this time? The centurion's servant was healed because of his own because of his owner's faith, but in this story, the only person who has any faith that the dead man can be raised is Jesus himself. Though Jesus loves to see the signs of faith, he isn't always bound by it, and in this case he acts freely from sheer compassion to do something nobody had imagined he could or would. Luke certainly wants us to make a connection between this scene and the later one when Jesus is himself carried off his widow's his widowed mother's eldest son for burial outside Jerusalem. In the present case, of course, the young man is brought back to ordinary life and will have to die again one day. Luke will eventually tell of Jesus's new life in which death is left behind for good. Come inside the story and allow its force to sweep over you. Walk in the crowd a few paces behind the bier on a hot day in Galilee, with the bright sun sparkling on the tears which are streaming down everyone's cheeks. Death is common enough and everyone knows what to do. The professional mourners and wailers are there, making plenty of noise so that friends and relatives, and particularly the poor mother, can cry their hearts out without the embarrassment of making a scene all by themselves. People are coming along with spices to anoint the body, ready to wrap them up in the grave clothes to offset the smell of decomposition. You make your way from the family home through the streets to the town gate. A death in a small Middle Eastern community touches everyone. The family burial plot will be a little way outside the town, probably a small cave in the side of a hill where the husband and father had been buried some time before, and where now his bones, folded with care and devotion, lie stored in a bone box, leaving the main shelf clear for the next burial. That's where the procession is going. Then quite suddenly, some strangers arrive, a man leading a small group of followers. He seems vaguely familiar. Upper Galilee isn't such a large place, and perhaps he grew up in a neighbouring village. He is looking at the widowed, and now doubly bereaved mother, and something inside him seems to be stirring. He comes up and says something to her, and then, to everyone's surprise and horror, he touches the beer. 
Nobody would normally do that except the official bearers. Touching a corpse or the beer or even the bearers themselves would make you unclean. And the biggest shock of all, he's telling the lad to get up. And he's getting up. The whole funeral procession goes wild with astonishment, delight and disbelief. They don't know which one to look at. The no longer dead boy, his amazed and ecstatic mother or this stranger who has done what the old prophets Elijah and Elisha used to do. God has visited his people, they say, not in the sense of praying, but paying them a social visit, but in the old biblical sense, where this phrase was used to refer to God visiting Israel at the time of the Exodus and other great events. It means God has come near to us to save and rescue us. It means this is the time we've been waiting for. Now go through the scene again, but this time, instead of it being a funeral procession in a small first century Galilean town, make it the moment you most dread in this next week or next year. Maybe it's something that you know is going to happen, like a traumatic move or of house or job. Maybe it's something you are always afraid of, a sudden accident or illness, a tragedy or a scandal. Come into the middle of the scene, if you can, in prayer. Feel its sorrow and frustration, its bitterness and anger. Then watch as Jesus comes to join you in the middle of it. Take time in prayer and let him approach, speak, touch and command. He may not say what you expect. He may not do what you want. But if his presence comes to be with you there, that is what you most need. Once he is in the middle of it all with you, you will be able to come through it. The two stories that start Luke chapter 7, the centurion's servant and the widow's son, do two things in particular as Luke's larger narrative develops. They take the commands of the great sermon in chapter 6 and they show what this life looks like on the ground with God's love going out in new unexpected healing generosity. And they prepare us for the unexpected healing generosity um, of the question that is now emerging as the central one. Who does Jesus think he is? What do these actions say about his own role, his vocation and his mission? We say the Benedictus together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. So let's pray. Through Christ, who ever lives to make intercession for us, let us pray to the Lord. Lift up our hearts to the heavenly places and inspire us to serve you as a royal priesthood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let all people acknowledge your kingdom and grant on earth the blessing of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send down upon us the gift of the Spirit and renew your church with power from on high. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May peace abound and righteousness flourish that we may vanquish in injustice and wrong. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to proclaim the good news of salvation and grant us the needful gifts of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And so let us commend the world for which Christ prays to the mercy and protection of God. Amen. And the collect for today. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ is gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And so, being made one by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May the Spirit kindle in us the fire of God's love. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Well, it's been a joy to pray with you as ever. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you again soon. God bless.